I love taking photos. I have so many memories stored on my phone. Look at this photo I took last week with my dog. It's my favorite photo I've ever taken. And these from our walks. I am so glad I have Google Photos. It makes it so easy to store, organize, and share my pictures. I can access my photos from anywhere and then share them with anybody I choose across the world. And it doesn't just do it for you and me. It stores photos and memories for over 1 billion users. At that scale, it must be an engineering challenge and a marvel to uncover and learn about. Are you excited to take a dive with me and how Google Photos works? Stick around because this is going to be fun. Hi everyone, I'm Priyanka Vergaria and today I'm here with Tracy and Dave from our Google Photos team who will help us take a closer look at how Google Photos works. Hi, Tracy and Dave. Hey, Priyanka. Hey, Priyanka. Great to be here today. So I'm Dave. I'm a senior software engineering manager at Google, and I lead the storage, serving, and ML infrastructure teams for Google Photos. Hi, and I'm Tracy, a senior site reliability manager with Google Photos, and I've led the Photos SRE team for over the past three years. My team and Dave's team work very closely to ensure that Photos is reliable, available, and efficient. And that's no small task given that Photos serves over a billion users, as you said, Priyanka, and we continue to grow. That's right. Google Photos is such a huge application. And if we are really, I just want to dive deeper into how it works. I'm so curious. So if we track, let's say, life of a photo, uh, I took a picture on my phone. What is actually happening behind the scenes? Can you walk us through that, Dave? We have a lot of cool stuff going on in our system. So it all starts when a user captures a photo or video on their phone. Google Photos will begin to upload the photos and videos to our product if that user has the backup feature enabled. Uh, backup is a really important feature. It's very popular, and it helps users automatically preserve their memories. Backup actually happens in two phases. So first, we upload all of the captured media bytes into our encrypted blob store, and then we upload, encrypt, and store all of the associated uh, metadata in Spanner, things like EXIF data, file name, and other product metadata. At that point, the user's photos and videos are safely stored in Google Photos. And we know that users trust us with their data. So we take a lot of care, a lot of time, a lot of energy to make sure that the core values of privacy and security are kept in mind. But honestly, uploading the media is just step one. From there, a whole bunch of asynchronous processing kicks off, much of which is tailored to a user's individual settings. That processing drives many of Google Photos' most magical machine learning powered features like memories, search, and a bunch of organizational features. And users get to experience these features just very shortly after upload. You just described it so well there because you upload the pictures and that upload part is sort of not even, like I'm not even a part of it. I just took a picture, it automatically backs up. It automatically goes there. And then if I'm even not doing anything, I just go back after a few days and I see some memories. So it's just this that seamless processing of things that is happening behind the scenes as a user, it is magical as an experience. So thanks for walking us through that. So Tracy, how as we, are, as users are able to access these photos all the time, really reliably across the globe. What happens there? Hey, Priyanka, great question. As you said, that's the magical part of photos. And photo actually relies on Spanner to automatically replicate our data and ensure that the data is co-located with our global user footprints. The sharding by Spanner also gives us low latency worldwide and makes it easy for us to support the ever-increasing set of regulatory requirements concerning data residency. However, as the SRE in the room, what's really interesting to us is that the system simultaneously has to be reliable and available for our user uploads what you experience, but we also need to ensure that our ML-based features that Dave talked about also perform well. Um, and that ML and batch features and um, computing can't impact our interactive users. So Spanner sharding flexibility allows us both use cases to be satisfied in the same database. We have read-only and write shards to separate these use cases because we need to serve our active online users quickly because we know they expect their photos to be instantaneously displayed and shareable, and we don't want those ML and batch features which are 
bringing a lot of the magic to photos to interrupt them. We don't want to slow our users down. An additional benefit that we have with these spanner shards I've talked about is we can perform slow rollouts, which allows us to observe how changes perform incrementally, and that's a huge win for our reliability of the Google Photos product. That's great because uh, with Spanner, you, you're literally using just one database and that's just driving all of these experiences, whether it's batch, upload, or it's uh, it's these machine learning and really rich um, features that we enjoy um, and experience. Now, as we, as we talk about machine learning, I have to ask, can we dive a little bit into how some of those ML features work, especially at that scale of photos? For, um, I'll take an example here. If I wanted to search my library for something like, let's say, I love my dog. Let's say I'm searching for all the pictures of my dog. I'm wanting to create a custom album. How does that work? Scale has become a bigger and bigger challenge as we've grown as a product. We rely really heavily on asynchronous background processing to handle that scale, and it actually makes up the majority of our workloads these days. So after a photo gets uploaded to the system, we queue that photo up for various forms of offline image processing and ML inference that help us label, understand, and organize that media within a user's library. The system doesn't just try to infer the semantic contents of a single photo, but it actually tries to understand how that content fits into the broader context of a user's library. And doing so involves many large and complicated queries within a user's library, all of which kind of happen concurrently with many other reads and writes running at the same time. And once the system's inferred labels from that photo, the labels actually get stored in Spanner and indexed by our downstream indexing system. They get combined with outputs from our clustering algorithm and form a basis on which users can search their library and experience it in different ways. This reminds me of an example where I, um, so at my wedding, I had some extensions on. So I had long hair and um, and and I normally, I never had that before. So um, it, it got like, so when I, when I, uploaded those pictures got uploaded there's like there was this confirmation right is this still you and then it's like taking four or five of these examples and like trying to evaluate if it's still me um which was amazing like i would like I love those features where I don't have to tell you that it's me. You're like, I already identifying it's me and then doing it. And it's all that machine learning goodness that's happening. So with that, uh, photo search really is an amazing feature, but also sounds like a lot of a lot went into building it, right? Yeah, to your point, the system is constantly learning and improving, and we really want to deliver the best possible user experience that we can. We push ourselves constantly on it. But to tell you the truth, we're so lucky to have a large and really talented team working on Google Photos, and we're also supported by a great research team and a whole bunch of great infrastructure teams. It really is one big team effort to make all of this happen. And now I keep going back to that life of a photo because I really grasp concepts with some examples. So here's another scenario. I love the pictures from my recent trip to Costa Rica, and I really want to share them, let's say, with my mom, who is across the world in India. How does sharing like that in real world uh, happens? How does that work? Yeah, so we're a close tie sharing product, and we really want to make sure that no matter how far your friends and family are, you're able to share your memories with them. And, you know, even if it is a global user base, users still have high standards. They want seamless real-time sharing of their content. And fortunately, Spanner has global indices and other functionality which have helped us deliver on that user experience. And if you think about it, the, the system really is conceptually very simple. You have users that are uploading their photos, the bytes are going into blob storage, the metadata is going into spanner, and there are lots of microservices all that are receiving and adding information to this central huge scale database, Spanner. But the big deal here is the choice of tools, right? So in this case, Spanner. So can, can we go into how Spanner supports photos as a, at such an incredible scale? Simple is definitely good. The truth is that we actually run hundreds of binaries and microservices under the hood. And all of these services have different access patterns ranging from small lookups to large data scans, as well as a variety of latency and reliability requirements. But despite all that, Spanner's been able to meet every requirement we've had completely off the shelf. It's been super flexible, really easy to use, and I think it's really impressive given our massive scale. 
So one of the key things as a user of Google Photos that I care about is the security of my photos and videos, who can access them and when and how. So how do you handle the security aspect in Google Photos? User trust is a key part of our story. Spanner is super reliable, so we're confident that user data will always be available when a user wants it or needs it. And it's also super secure. Data is encrypted at rest, and it's tightly access controlled to protect against bad actors or other unauthorized access. These are very fundamental security measures that we have in place for every feature. And as we build new features, that security and privacy is kept in mind from the very start, which has helped us iterate quickly without compromising the bar. That is great to hear. And as a user, when I have these precious memories and my photos, I want to be able to trust that I'll be able to access them reliably wherever and whenever I want. So um, can you tell a little bit about um, how Spanner assists with uh, not just security, but also that trust part? I think there's two key things. I think we have a simpler, more maintainable architecture, and I think it's helped us move more quickly. And a lot of that is because Spanner is so scalable and easy to use. We have been able to sustain that single database, and it's yielded that simpler development experience and allowed us to lean into our microsystem architecture. All of this, in turn, has helped us manage our technical debt and support a fast, tight release cycle. Not to mention, Spanner's SQL features have helped our developers write highly optimized queries and also more easily debug the features and services that they're building. Yeah, Dave, I was just remembering how there was a lot of doubt in a lot of people's mind that we could actually run a database at this scale, a single database at this scale. And it's we've actually been very successful at it. But I would say equally as important for Velocity on the SRE side, the fact that Spanner is reliable allows us to run a single database and the features within Spanner, we've significantly reduced our toil as an SRE team. We save a lot of time and energy on tactical placements, location distribution, sharding, scaling, redundancy, and the backup management. For repl replicas, for example, all we need to do is input the specs to Spanner, and Spanner handles the change in the replication that we, would, that we desire. In addition, the self-healing nature of Spanner, such as automated index verifications, automatic sharding, draining, guaranteed data consistency, saves us a lot of manual work. Anything else that you would like to highlight that we haven't covered yet? Look, the truth is that Photos has seen amazing success running on Spanner, and I think the numbers speak for themselves. Our product is massive, over a billion users, over a trillion images, over four trillion images, all stored securely and privately. And Spanner's played a huge role in all of this. It serves millions of queries across dozens of geographical zones in order to support us. And believe it or not, we've actually experienced that 10x growth since starting out. And we're confident that Spanner is going to be able to support another tenfold increase and continue to help us develop, to deliver amazing, incredible user experiences. It's really amazing what it's helped us to do. And I can't wait to see what it helps us do in the future. Quite frankly, I think it's going to really help us bring Google Photos to the next billion users. That is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with me, walking me through how the whole thing works, what happens with the photo, and what is happening behind the scenes in powering that amazing experience that billions of us are using today. Um, thank you, Dave and Tracy. Hey, Priyanka, thanks for having us. We love to talk about photos all day long, as you can tell. Yeah, this was a ton of fun. Thanks so much, Priyanka. Well, I really learned a lot about the life of a photo and how it goes through the Google Photos infrastructure. The big lesson as a cloud architect here is the architecture is usually pretty simple. It's the choice of the right tools that lead to success in meeting those goals. In this case, Spanner is the key ingredient in scaling the Photos platform.